Today's video is very important. It will literally help you save lives. How to respond and act to a hypotensive patient in real life practice is our topic today. Hypotension means your patient is unstable. Each minute counts. The sooner you appropriately act, the higher the chance your patient will make it. This is going to be a heavy topic with a lot of important practical information, so I decided to split it into two parts. Today's part will discuss how to identify the patients who are truly hypotensive, how to respond to them, and how to stabilize them. Next video will discuss how to identify the source and cause of their problems and of course how to treat it. Make sure no distractions, have a pen and paper and watch till the end please. You may need to watch this video more than once. So before we start, don't forget to give this video a like and share it with your colleagues if you found it useful. Let's go. First, what's the definition of low blood pressure or hypotension? I found the following definition of hypotension in the literature. Absolute hypotension where systolic blood pressure less than 90 mm Hg or mean arterial blood pressure less than 65. Relative hypotension where there is a drop more than 40 mm Hg in systolic blood pressure or orthostatic hypotension where there is a drop more than 20 in systolic blood pressure or 10 mm Hg in diastolic blood pressure. Now in real life practice, hypotension is defined by the presence of low blood pressure and hypoperfusion symptoms and signs. The presence of hypoperfusion signs and symptoms is essential to say the patient is truly hypotensive. Probably you noticed here I use the term low blood pressure without providing an absolute value. Why? Simply hypoperfusion signs and symptoms may appear in a patient whose systolic blood pressure is 110. On the other hand, this would be a perfectly normal blood pressure in other patients. That's why in real life clinical practice, we don't rely on absolute values to define hypotension for treatment purposes. Low blood pressure without hypoperfusion signs and symptoms does not warrant any further workup or treatment as this is likely the patient's baseline blood pressure. Please check their blood pressure trend and see if this is really their baseline blood pressure or was this just and a one off the trend value, in such case, it is likely an error measuring their blood pressure. Kindly ask them to repeat the blood pressure measurement. These patients just need monitoring, reviewing their medications, and stopping any drug that lowers their blood pressure if not absolutely necessary. So what are the signs and symptoms of hypoperfusion? Please give me your full attention here. All of the following can be considered a sign or symptom of hypoperfusion. The most important one, a change in mental status. The patient may develop confusion, agitation, lethargy, or obtundation, chest pain, shortness of breath, dizziness, or lightheadedness, oligouria, or low urine output. And this is a difficult one to assess if urine output was not being monitored during the admission already for this patient. Cold, clammy, and sometimes cyanotic skin, very important sign. And very important, don't forget abnormal other vital signs. Patient may be tachycardiac, bradycardiac, tachypneic, hypothermic, or hypoxic. That's why I always ask about the full set of vital signs whenever I get called about a patient's symptoms during the night or at any point. So every time a nurse calls us about a hypotensive patient, we should immediately ask about the rest of the vital signs, very important, and any other hypoperfusion signs or symptoms, and simply ask your nurse, what are the rest of the values of the vital signs, and is the patient having any active symptoms or signs of hypoperfusion? Sometimes you need to specifically ask about the specific symptoms. If the answer is yes to either one, this is a medical emergency until proven otherwise, leave everything and go see your patient right away, please. Now, what if the nurse could not answer your question? Do the same, just go immediately to assess your patient yourself. Now, there is a subset of patients who may only develop mild symptoms of dizziness and lightheadedness, and in orthostatic patients, these symptoms may develop only upon standing. The rest of their vital signs are pretty stable, although sometimes mild tachycardia may be present. These patients still need to be seen and evaluated quickly, in such patients, do the following, please. Make sure to discontinue all the culprit medications, any medications that lower their blood pressure. Keep them in bed and start full precautions. Check for any ongoing volume loss like vomiting, diarrhea, bleeding. Initiate a fluid bolus with isotonic solution like normal saline, lactated drinker, or plasma light if available. 
The fluid bolus can be given as fast as possible or what we call wide open or over 30 to 60 minutes, especially in elderly and in those with a history of heart failure. Make sure to repeat their blood pressure and follow up on symptoms resolution. If no improvement, we can repeat the fluid bolus or we can instead give another liter over the next six to 12 hours. Again, check for symptoms resolution and the improvement in their blood pressure. Now, this is very important. Remember that the only true contraindication to give IV fluid is active pulmonary edema. That's it. Now, make sure to stop all offending agents and treat any underlying process, diarrhea treated, vomiting treated. Now, as soon as this issue resolves, stop IV fluid unless there is an ongoing volume loss like constant diarrhea, for example. And remember to take the patient off bed rest status and start moving them, ambulating them with assistance to make sure they don't fall. Now, let's talk about patients who are hemodynamically unstable. Their blood pressure is low with more serious hyperperfusion signs and symptoms. These patients are in shock or going into shock. Each second counts and can go into cardiac arrest at any moment. Tell your nurse over the phone that you are coming right away. Meanwhile, ask your nurse to put the patient on a 100% non-breather oxygen mask, to put the patient on a monitor right away, if not on a monitor yet, get the crash cart into the room and place the pads on the patient's chest. If your hospital has what we call a rapid response team, just ask your nurse to call for rapid response, that's all. Activating a rapid response team means getting immediate help from the ICU team, ICU nurse, respiratory therapy, the crash cart will be taken immediately to the patient room, the patient will be placed on a monitor right away, so if you have this protocol in your hospital, in your facility, don't hesitate to call it whenever in doubt. It's better to be safe than sorry. Remember, rapid response is different from code blue, which is reserved for those in cardiac or respiratory arrest or impending arrest. Rapid response, of course, can be switched or changed into code blue if needed. Now, while running to the room, remember these three words, stabilize, recognize, and treat. Stabilize the patient, recognize the source of the problem, then treat the source of the problem. I highly recommend if you are still an intern, you call for help from your senior resident right away and ask someone to notify the patient's family as well. I usually have the patient's nurse, her, her or himself do that once I have enough help in the room. Now pay attention here, this is important. The moment I enter the patient's room, I immediately make sure of the following. The patient is on the monitor and the pads are on the patient's chest. This usually get forgetting about, the pads on the chest. The patient is on 100% non-breather mask if hypoxic. Firmly and loudly ask if there is adequate IV access or not. Ask about the patient, very important, about the patient code status. Is the patient full cord or do not resuscitate or do not intubate? And I take a quick glance at the monitor to check the most recent vital signs and the patient rhythm. Now, believe it or not, all of this can be done in less than 10 seconds and should be done in less than 10 seconds. Be firm, loud, but respectful so everyone in the room knows you are in charge. At this point, the goal is to stabilize the patient as much as we can so we can transfer him or her to the ICU. Now let's go back to the basics. Remember the ABC, airway, breathing, circulation. Please do the following. Secure the airways with endotracheal intubation immediately if the patient remained unresponsive despite trying to aggressively stimulate with a sternal rub or any strong painful stimuli, or the patient is responsive but pretty lethargic with drooling, gurgling, or vomiting. Also proceed with endotracheal intubation if the patient is very hypoxic despite a 100% non-rebreather mask, Given how unstable the patient is, there may not be enough time to try non-invasive positive pressure ventilation at this point. Now remember that proceed with intubation only if the patient is full code and does not have a do not intubate status. In case the patient does have do not intubate status, I usually try my best to resuscitate them as much as I can. And if the patient remain extremely unstable, I just call the family and talk to them about stopping and letting the patient peacefully go. The bottom line here in airway and breathing, we are dealing with unstable patients. So have a low threshold to intubate these patients. Also keep in mind these patient mental status can change very quickly. They may be awake initially and quickly become unresponsive. For more details on the endotracheal intubation procedure itself, I have a dedicated playlist in the channel that describes the procedure in detail. 
a link to the playlist is provided in the description field. Now, if you are not comfortable managing the patient and performing the intubation procedure at the same time, have someone else perform it for you, like an ER physician, anesthesiologist, or one of your colleagues. Now, simultaneously, while checking airways and breathing, we should be checking circulation. Checking circulation involves three things. Checking the pulse, monitoring the heart rhythm, stabilizing the blood pressure. Please have someone check the carotid pulse immediately if your patient is unresponsive. Unresponsive patients need a continuous pulse check, so please assign someone to keep checking the pulse for you. Now call code blue and initiate CPR at any moment the pulse cannot be felt anymore, unless the patient has a do not resuscitate status in such case, I ask two people to verify the absence of the pulse, and if the patient is pulseless, we pronounce his or her death. I also have two dedicated videos on how to run an efficient code blue. The links to both videos also provided in the description field. While all this going, keep an eye on the monitor on the rhythm, especially heart rate, and QRS complex width. Progressive bradycardia and QRS prolongation are signs of imminent cardiac arrest. In this case, pushing an amp of epinephrine, amp of bicarb, amp of calcium can be helpful to buy you some time and prevent the patient from going into cardiac arrest as, they, as these patients likely developing severe metabolic acidosis and hyperkalemia. So please keep an eye on the monitor for two main reasons, checking the rhythm, specifically heart rate and QRS width, and vital sign checks. Blood pressure, as I mentioned before, should be checked every three to five minutes. Remember, here we are talking about a patient on the floor, not in the ICU that has an arterial line with continuous blood pressure monitoring. Now, at the same time, while checking the pulse and looking at the monitor, tell your nurse to start IV fluid resuscitation, which by default means giving isotonic solution like normal saline, lactated ringer, or plasma light. I have a detailed playlist on IV fluid. The link to this playlist also provided in the description field. Give two to three liters of isotonic solution as fast as possible. You can run two liters at the same time if the patient has two IV accesses. More IV fluid may be needed, especially if there is ongoing volume loss such as diarrhea, vomiting, bleeding, etc. Again, remember to recycle the blood pressure every three to five minutes to see if there is any response and improvement in the blood pressure. Again, the only contraindication to give IV fluid resuscitation is active pulmonary edema. These patients are usually short to breath, hypoxic, have crackles in their lungs, with or without peripheral edema. Now, when should we use vasopressors? Vasopressors at this stage are reserved for the following. Hypotensive patients who are in active pulmonary edema and we cannot give IV fluid. For those with extreme hypotension, let's say systolic blood pressure less than 60, here I give IV fluid and start vasopressor simultaneously. And in patients with severe anaphylaxis or anaphylactic shock, here I give them IV fluid and administer epinephrine at the same time. Norepinephrine should be our first choice, except of course for anaphylactic shock where epinephrine should be the first choice. At this point, it doesn't matter if the patient has a central venous axis or not to give vasopressor. The patient is literally dying, crashing, and we're trying to save his or her life. As soon as your patient becomes relatively stable to the point that we can transfer to ICU, move them immediately to the ICU. ICU is a much better environment for such critically ill patients. During the transfer, please remain with your patient, of course, with the patient's nurse, the ICU nurse, respiratory therapist, and the patient should remain on the monitor, the pads should remain on the chest, and ask the nurse to carry amps of epinephrine, calcium, and bicarb ready just in case we need to push any of those during the transfer process. I will stop this video here to keep it short and help you digest the information better. Next video, I will discuss how to recognize and identify the source of the problem, what's causing the patient hypotension and shock, and of course, how to treat it. If you find this video useful, make sure to share it with your colleagues, please. And if you don't mind, hit the like button as well. I'll see you next video.